Well, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Ramon Acedo Rodriguez. I'm uh, one of the product managers working with OpenShift. Um, and today, we will give you, you know, a short update on our roadmap, things that are coming, things that uh, we are working on. And if this lets me, <laughs> sorry. Otherwise, we can do it manually. Yeah, here, here we go. go. Thank you. No problem. Okay. So mm -hmm. let's talk about the hybrid cloud uh, to start with, uh, which is very related to everything we do with uh, Kubernetes, OpenShift. And, um, you know, for the past 10 years or so at Red Cat, we've been <laughs> investing a lot in hybrid cloud. And our customers and users have also been investing in innovating with their apps in the different, um, you know, types of applications that you may have, right? From the traditional end-tier applications to more cloud-native uh, type of applications, right? And all of these uh, can be done across all our footprints. Here you can see five uh, footprints that we have from the physical bare metal nodes where you can install Kubernetes. Virtual machines, you know, the traditional virtualization platforms, um, but then also your private cloud. Uh, think about OpenStack or others as well, along with the public clouds that we all know, uh, and uh, Edge Cloud. We will talk a little bit about Edge as well today. And thinking about OpenShift right now, Kubernetes delivered um, with OpenShift. You have two ways, right, uh, to access um, <coughs> Kubernetes from OpenShift. It is a self-managed platform, right, uh, on the top. So you have uh, AWS, uh, Microsoft Azure, IBM Cloud, and then Red Hat's own cloud that's backed by AWS and uh, Google Cloud, right? Those are self-managed, uh, co-engineered between Red Hat and the cloud provider. Um, by the way, today, after this session, we have, uh, as Diane was saying, um, a session with AWS about application uh, modernization. So that falls into the top right uh, bucket here with uh, AWS. And also, you know, we're talking about all the footprints that you have with OpenShift. Well, you can self-manage your OpenShift, self-manage Kubernetes, right? So with this, today, uh, I want to Pass it on to Daniel, who's going to do a demonstration of OpenShift, and then we will continue with the roadmap update. Thank you so much, Ramon. Hi, everybody. Hola, uh, como estas? Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm working for Red Hat as a developer advocate, as well as a CNCF ambassador. So what I'm going to do is showcase today. So here is, a, I'm going to use OpenShift 4.10. This is a where we are, and then I'm going to showcase uh, here is a couple of the uh, architecture. A little bit complicated, this one, but don't worry. I'm going to uh, go through a little bit deep, uh, step by step. And then there are a bunch of the uh, capability on OpenShift 4.10. For example, the advanced cloud management and then container security and the GitOps pipeline. This is not about only developer, but also SRE and DevOps engineer or application architecture or uh, your DevOps team leaders. So I'm going to showcase uh, a bunch of stuff in the next 15 minutes. And then, uh, yeah, so I'm going to stop uh, my presentation. So here's my OpenShift cluster for 10. And as you can see, hopefully you guys see, I, got, I already installed a bunch of the operators. So you can see uh, advanced management Kubernetes for ACS. It's a uh, uh, managed and allows you have uh, container security like a Docker uh, cyber benchmark or any CBA violation. You could keep monitoring and secure your cluster. And also they'll get off based on Tecton pipeline to CICD pipeline as well as uh, Argo CD. Uh, based on that, you're going to have your GitOps pipeline from your GIB application repository. And the last thing is uh, ACM. So for example, your company needed to manage multiple cluster, not just single on-prem Kubernetes, but also you have Kubernetes on uh, Amazon or Google, Microsoft, or DigitalOcean. How to manage multiple cluster for, along with your uh, multiple cloud strategy or hybrid cloud strategy. So here is the answer to uh, enable you can manage that kind of multiple cluster. So I already installed the operator you can go to as long as you have a cross admin permission. And I'm going to start uh, how to get uh, start to develop 
and I create the GitOps pipeline. And actually, I have already uh, created my CI CD pipeline. This is GitOps based on Argo CD. You can actually create this Argo CD using Opportunity GitOps pipeline and operator. And then here is a bunch of stuff. And then I have a developer environment, I have a production environment. But here is uh, the command line. Uh, all right, so the CAM CLI, I'm going to make it bigger a little bit uh, for the back end here. OK, hopefully you guys all see that. So this is uh, OpenShift uh, application GitOps managed CLI. So CAM Bootstrap allows me to have a bunch of the YAML file or as well as a secret file. Uh, when you run this uh, CLI, as you can see, I already set it up. Uh, the GitOps pipeline, GitOps repository, as you can see. I'm going to put it up there in a minute. And also here is the actual application GitOps repository. And then uh, here is the access token, which allows me to access my uh, external container registry. I'm going to use Quade.io. You can also use Docker Hub or Google uh, Container Registry, which allows me actually, when I change my application, it automatically push it into container registry based on Tecton pipeline. And then also uh, when I uh, re-tag my container image on my GitHub repository, it automatically trigger your Argo CD to deploy application into target environment, for example, dev cluster or production cluster, et cetera. So once you uh, run this command line and then you got a bunch of the uh, secret file, as you can see, uh, here is a secret file. So I already uh, opened my terminal based on my v, uh, ID tool, and then go to uh, configuration. You can see Argo CD all YAML file, and then also CI CD based on Tecton, how to deploy your application from uh, dev cluster or your staging, production, etc. Also, here's the uh, environment for dev and production. When I go to uh, application service and uh, base here in the configuration, the bunch of the YAML file, how to deploy application onto Kubernetes cluster. So today I'm going to use one of the Java application. Everybody say, oh, Java is too old. It's maybe 25 years old technology, but it's still evolving. So I'm going to use the application. It's one of the popular game Windows operating system back in 1995. So Minesweeper. So I'm going to really tweak that application based on Quarkus, uh, which he uh, made me a uh, little bit evolving uh, cloud neighbor Microsoft application in the end on running on Kubernetes. So go back to web browser. So this is my GitHub repository. I'm going to make it bigger here. So here's the GitOps uh, repository for Microsweeper. This is a publicly available. So when you go back to my here, and here is actually a QR code. You can scan it. I'm going to share this slide later today, and then you can scan this QR code. You can go to entire the demo environment, just a YouTube channel, and you can find all step by step. I don't have enough time to step by step all kind of stuff today. So back to the Git repository here, the GitOps. You can see computation environment, and then uh, go to application itself, Quarkus. And then here's the application. You can go to uh, source and some of the stuff. If you are familiar with the Java application, this is a Maven project. I got to just uh, develop the application. And one of the interesting part, when you go to setting on the GitHub repository, and then uh, there are developer setting, and then I just create to personal access token. And here is the CAM CLI. I'm going to uh, input my super secret password here. So this is the way uh, how the Tecton pipeline trigger and then automatically detect some of the change by GitHub repository. So this is a common practice how developer actually develop application. And then once they done, just push the code into GitHub repository. And after that, uh, the nice, smart uh, CI CD pipeline detect the change and automatically start your uh, pipeline and the build and deployment, et cetera. And here is the uh, Quay.io. It's an external container registry. So in this setting, and then I actually created uh, the credential for uh, the 
containerized access and authorization and authentication based robot, which means that whenever I change and retag a new image into container registry, and then Argo City automatically detect the change and deploy the target environment. So I got to set it a bunch of stuff, uh, but maybe I got to skip some of the necessary uh, part, but I don't have enough time to do that. So just so it makes sense. And then here, back to the application. And uh, let's go to uh, ACM cluster. So when you install ACM and then you can find the ACM management, when you click on that, a new dashboard is just uh, open it. And then when you go to up upper view, and then it automatically is, uh, single sign on your OpenShift authentication and then log in my username, Daniel O. And then it show the two cluster, dev cluster and production cluster at this moment. You can actually do this, this same capability on your OpenShift 410 cluster for now. And then once you go to this ACM, and then we have a bunch of the application. So when you go back to OpenShift cluster, I actually deploy the application in dev namespace, and then change the dev console. And then you can find uh, the nice candy eyeball, the dev console UI. It takes some time to rendering the API, the UI based on your network bandwidth. So it takes some time. Go back to Atomic Cons the, A the ACM, and you can have a two cluster. Uh, and you go to cluster. Now we have a dev cluster I already showed in uh, Argo City. And the two cluster, one is dev cluster, the other is a production cluster, just like the one. So when you go to dev cluster C, and you can find all uh, relation, all Kubernetes resources. For example, here's the actual application and PostSQL, and then a bunch of the another resources, for example, services, and the point and router, et cetera. You can find all kinds of topology, uh, which resources uh, communicate uh, along with the, uh, your application and then Kubernetes manifestor. And you can see here, I'm going to make it bigger, two cluster and a local and a production. And then go to application view. It actually shows the similar topology in OpenShift console. Here's the OpenShift console. You can see it's the PostSQL and the simple uh, Quarkus application. And you click on the open URL, automatically open the actual application endpoint. So the OpenShift actually provides uh, the route URL, just like a Kubernetes ingress. So once you open up, you can see the uh, Minesweeper application in the, like uh, back in 1995, uh, the, the Minesweeper came. So I've been there, so let's try to give some time to uh, the application. I got to tweak a little bit, and here is a Microsweeper. I changed the title. And here's my board actually changed the backend application. This is all score stored in the PostSQL from the Quarkus application, which is a cloud and microservice Java framework invented the Red Hat. So when you go to ACM, you can have the application side, and then you can, you can have a similar topology just like you have uh, open to the console, but when you go to open to the console, for example, you have two cluster, which means you have two different cluster and two different console. But the ACM, you can just find all kind of stuff in the single pane of your console. So go to application and dev console. You can find the similar the topology application and route deployment, etc. And then go to route and then click on the route URL, and you can find the same application here. And then when you, I already. Uh, Play the game to time, and you can find the two score in my PostS database. And then when you go to production application here, and production, and then you can find the different topology, and then go to run to URL, and then you can find the production, and then I'm going to get a little bit bigger, and then the URL based on production. And then previous one is URL based on dev cluster. So that's why I go to production. It's a, so this deeper on the ID. I, I got to try in the morning. So you have a deeper on the my board here. So 
I'm going to show uh, another interesting part is the the ACS. ACS is an uh, advanced uh, container security for Kubernetes. So for example, you got a bunch of the application deployed and running on Kubernetes, and then there are a lot of uh, multiple persona to uh, secure your application as a well as the in, in infrastructure as well. So luckily, uh, OpenShift provides ACA operator, so I already installed it. So go back to uh, ACA stock racks. I just deployed, oh, <clears throat> I already, <clears throat> excuse me, I already deployed the bunch of the application, and then go to admin console, and then here's the operator. And then it will show up the ACS, and I already uh, deployed the central services, which he allows me have the ACS console here. So let me try to access ACS console. Go to uh, networking and the route, and then it will uh, automatically create the route you are to access ACS. So here we go. So I'm going to go to access the ACS route URL, and then it show me the all the violation stuff in the cluster. But in this case, I didn't edit it uh, secure cluster at this moment, just the empty uh, dashboard. So you don't have any uh, violation at this moment. So I'm going to try to showcase how to edit secure cluster specifically in this cluster. So in order to log in, I'm going to add admin and go back to the open to the console and there are secret object automatically generated when you install operator. And then here is the central password. You know, rebuild admin and then paste that password. Go back to here. So you can also uh, actually edit the secure cluster for ACS itself. As you can see, there's no uh, violation scanning at this moment. So I'm going to try to edit a new secure cluster for that. So ACS, one of the beauty of the ACS actually uh, provides some integration how to uh, create a secret file when you edit a new uh, cluster for security. For example, here's a ham chart. So I'm going to create a new my uh, secret based on uh, any bundle, and I just the uh, download all secret file, and then just try to where am I? My project I see is Star X, and then I see apply. I will see apply f uh, user. Then you oh, and download, and then I just copy secret file, and the same namespace ACA Starrax. So once I created uh, this secret file, uh, the my ACS actually uh, access that cluster to scan all kind of violation. So I just created three uh, secret. You can go to open the console in the same name space and go to secret. You can find the, one, the three secret, just like created it, like just now and just now and just now. Okay, so pretty cool. And I go back to operator. And I just need to secure a new cluster. New cluster. I'm gonna. You, you can actually leave all the default, something like that. One thing is the central endpoint. It should be your actual target cluster. In that case, uh, this is the ACS. Okay. Let me try to access the ACS first. Go to ACM. Okay, this is the ACS. So I'm going to copy the endpoint and paste it here. And then this is the HTTPS protocol TLS termination. I just create a new one. 
and then go to path, it will automatically uh, deploy a bunch of the path uh, to uh, access and then secure the ACS cluster itself. And then it, ta it takes some time uh, to finish all kind of stuff. I just actually download all comp container in advance. So it takes almost uh, done. I think it's done. OK, go back to my ACS and go to dashboard. And then go to compliance. And I try to scan in bottom once again. And then it takes some time, depends on the, uh, how much your application actually deployed. And you can see the bunch of the violations, you can find that. And then here is the uh, CIS, the cyber security for, based on Docker benchmark. And there's the bunch of those, uh, the HIPAA and the, uh, a lot of the, uh, the CBE uh, standard, you actually take care about uh, whenever you deploy the container application onto uh, Kubernetes in your production environment. And then I'm going to interesting stuff here. And then just reload, it takes some time to refresh your uh, dashboard because you all aggregate all your application and then in the end, it show up in the dashboard. In the meantime, so I got a one interesting uh, YAML file. This is my last thing. So look, for J, this is a one YAML file. So I just you probably know a couple of months ago, we have a, a very critical CBE around the Logo4j shell. So this is the same app, uh, example, uh, export the Logo4j CBE with the Java application. So I'm going to try to deploy that thing, go to another namespace here, CBE test, and I'm going to just import YAML file. So when you go to full video demo, you can actually find how to change your application and then uh, to push it into GID repository and then it will trigger CI/CD pipeline. And the pretty interesting part, okay. Okay, so I'm gonna skip that thing. So, so this is the last part, I'm gonna show that. So, uh, so just a quick summary, so Currently, you have ACS and ACM, and also uh, the, the GitOps pipeline uh, capability on OpenShift 410. So I'm going to hand it over to Daniel to talk about what is the next thing in OpenShift and a lot of the bunch of the capability. I'm Daniel Messer. I'm a product manager in the OpenShift group in Red Hat. And what you just saw are all current capabilities. So all of the things that Dan showed you with multi-cluster visibility in ACM, multi-cluster security analysis and reporting with ACS, GitOps-driven deployment and pipelines with Tecton and Argo, all this is possible already today. So what I and the neighbor also Ramon are going to talk about you now is the future. What are our plans and visions for the remainder of this year and the future of OpenShift beyond that? at the platform level. And we group this in kind of three um, main areas that we want to talk about. And the first one is multi-cluster. So multi-cluster is something uh, uh, that we take the whole platform into in the main direction, moving away from this model where we have very few but extremely large clusters with hundreds and thousands of namespaces shared by hundreds and hundreds of tenants to a model where we are essentially looking at a um, uh, 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 architecture it looks like this. So we want to, to be able to uh, bring in um, uh, tenants into their own clusters, to bring in clusters for specific purposes with specific hardware, from specific cloud providers or infrastructure providers, and manage them at the fleet level. So we are not just telling you, hey, run multiple clusters, because now it's so easy with OpenShift to do that. We want you to do this in a way where the scales and you aren't drowning yourself in work because you need to keep all of this operational. So when we talk about multi-cluster, you need to have a couple of things uh, uh, in check. The first is the storage layer that from a central pool of storage allows your applications to get persistent storage uh, from a central source for efficiency, to be also to reclaim it later when it's no longer needed, but also in a way that you can have data move from one cluster to another cluster, right? You don't want to be stuck in one cluster just because your data sits in that particular region or data center. You want to have the ability to move the data over to another cluster for failover purposes. So a multi-cluster storage layer is required to actually do that. And 
in those clusters, you uh, still have their own individual ingress uh, point for network traffic. That's where the applications sit. But the applications can't be aware and dependent on the fact uh, that they are running across multiple clusters. It needs to be transparent to them, right? We don't want to rewrite our application just for it to work on a multi-cluster. It should just work out of the box. And for that, you need a multi-cluster networking solution. Uh, so you need to have the ability to essentially transparently route east-west traffic between the clusters so that it is sort of seamless and transparent to the application itself. This is what you need at the infrastructure level. And in order to effectively do that at scale without doubling or tripling your team size, you need to have tuning, right? You need to have the ability to have insight of what is running in all your clusters, but also from a central point, deploy applications across those enforce policies across those clusters, figure out security um, violations in various clusters and remediate them and get alerted about it. And whenever you talk about having multiple clusters, you also need a central source of truth of all the containerized software that you are running in these clusters. So this is coming together with a container registry that sits in sort of a hub position. So these three main pillars, multi-cluster security, multi-cluster management and container registry, these are the core pillars of our multi-cluster approach um, where we basically standardize all this tuning irregardless of how many clusters you end up running and where. So the first is cluster management. And uh, we are true to our word. We open source everything. So we open sourced what we call in the product space advanced cluster management with the open cluster management project. And we didn't just open source it and put it on GitHub. We actually donated it to the CNCF last year. So the core parts of what it takes to do multi-cluster lifecycle, application deployment across multiple clusters, as well as policy enforcement, is in the Open Cluster Management Project, which is a CNCF project now. These are the base building blocks in the form of the APIs and the controllers that make this up. And as you can see, it spans the various six and working groups and already gets contributions um, and uh, community momentum also from our partners. So Open Cluster Management is one part. Um, because we donated this to CNCF, it needed to be free of things that aren't in CNCF, right? So we actually took out the uh, components that are OKD and OpenShift specific and put them into a separate sort of midstream project that we call Stolostron. Uh, Stolos is a fleet and Tron is tools, so it's kind of a fleet tool, but these are all the extensions that make ACM capable of managing OpenShift and OKD clusters, specifically creating them, um, managing them over their life cycle, um, as well as give you a graphical console and a search capability. This is also where we do integration with Hive for cl cluster provisioning, Submariner for east-west nef uh, network traffic uh, uh, isolation, as well as volume syncing for actually replicating storage across clusters using a shared storage system. So just to not be confused, these are two open source projects that kind of flow into the ACM product, uh, and that's where all the innovation happens upstream. So what we are focusing on in multi-cluster is specifically the networking part, because this is crucial to get right. If you don't have that, your multi-cluster deployment is going to be very complicated and it's going to be very manual. So we are investing heavily in this multi-cluster networking layer based on the Submariner technology to essentially allow pods running in different clusters communicate through what they perceive as a very flat network namespace. So they don't perceive any boundaries of their own cluster. They don't even know that the part they are talking to may actually sit in another cluster very far away. It's completely the same as talking to parts and services in the same cluster. And this is the level of transparency and abstraction you need in order to essentially carry out uh, multi-cluster networking where the clusters themselves are connected east-west-wise with IPsec tunnels. But from the pod perspective, it's all one flat networking namespace. So this makes it possible to just place your pods wherever there is either free capacity or special hardware that you need, or according to your fault tolerance policy, um, another independent region. So you're not looking at one cluster as a single point of failure. What we're also looking to do in ACM, and I say ACM synonymously with open cluster management and Stolostron, is the um, uh, ability to import and uh, manage uh, OpenShift and OKD clusters and other compute architectures. So x86 is what we are doing these days, also Power and System Z, but we're also going to support ARM this year. OpenShift and OKD already supports ARM since version 4.10, so the cluster management layer will also start to support that and learn how to deploy clusters on these infrastructures. 
And um, for the storage part, we are betting on Volsync, the uh, formerly known as Scribe. Uh, this project is used to essentially asynchronously replicate data from persistent volumes across clusters in the background for the purposes of being able to make a disaster recovery uh, possible. So you would be able to take data out of one cluster and move it into another cluster. You actually do this continuously in the background and that gives you the opportunity to fail over a workload to a completely different cluster if you have a catastrophic failure in a region or a data center. So this is done with Walsing integration. But um, when we talk about this cluster management architecture, you will see that um, the cluster management stack itself, the ACM on open cluster management technology, runs on OpenShift itself, right? So we call this a hub cluster, and this is an infrastructure only cluster that doesn't run any workloads. It really just runs the infrastructure to do multi-cluster management. And this is something you definitely want to be able to back up and restore in case it completely fails. So ACM will learn how to do that with their regional hub architecture and uh, will allow you to back up and restore the cluster, that multi-cluster management stack completely in case you have a catastrophic outage there. What it will also support is uh, deploying OpenShift in a slightly different way. So we have these um, uh, master worker node model today where you have a control plane separate from the masters and you use specific nodes for the control plane. In the HyperShift project uh, that we are working at upstream, you will be able to containerize the control plane and run it on OpenShift itself, saving you from procuring and providing separate machines just for a control plane for a cluster. You will have a larger managed cluster that does that in the form of container orchestration. It will just run the API server and etcd as containers, but the actual worker nodes of the cluster will still be external nodes. Um, so this is the HyperShift project, and um, ACM will learn how to provision clusters in that specific way uh, in the future as well. Another important aspect, and you will hear about this later today, is uh, uh, security enforced by content integrity and uh, verification. So signing is an important topic in this uh, world, and we uh, specifically sponsor the Six Store project, which concerns itself with signing cloud-native artifacts. And when we talk about cloud-native artifacts, we usually mean container images, but you can also sign other artifacts, for instance, manifests. And if you know a little bit about ACM, you know that all the policies, all the regulations and rules and applications that it manages are expressed in the form of YAML manifests. And with Six Store, we can actually sign these YAML manifests and prove to you that this is the exact same manifest that you get when you pulled it from an uh, uh, external source. So we are essentially providing integrity not just around the images, but also around these manifests. This is the basic cluster management layer. This is open cluster management and Stolostron. But what you also want is sort of a console graphical UI experience around that, right? And we have an awesome console in each cluster with the OpenShift console. And what we are doing is we are elevating this experience up to the fleet level. So you have a console that's actually multi-cluster aware and will, as you've seen previously in the demo, start to integrate many of these multi-cluster management aspects into one common console framework. So you have the OpenShift admin console next to the developer console, next to the ACM console, next to the ACS console as well, in one view screen, basically. And you will be able to zoom into particular clusters in your fleet, but also zoom out at the fleet level to uh, basically have a fleet-wide overview of uh, policy enforcement, applications running, as well as security profiles being enforced. And this is done with this unified cluster engine. There is a new operator that we are introducing called multi-cluster engine, which is actually taking out some of the basic cluster lifecycle that ACM does into its own operator that's available to every OpenShift and OKD cluster. And this is driving this unified console. And what it does, it allows you to essentially um, use things like fleet-wide authentication. So you don't have to log in into each and every cluster individually. Um, there is fleet-wide uh, single sign-on in place that allows you to be logged into all clusters simultaneously if they have the permission to do so. This is done by an extremely interesting uh, uh, project that we are conducting in the console that we call dynamic plugins. So all these new UI experiences that we are sort of working into the OpenShift console are uh, carried out with a plugin framework. And this is not just something we use in order to bring ACS and ACM into the console. It's actually something that our virtuous users, as um, Diane used to call them, and also our partners can use to build their own UI experiences 
right inside OpenShift. It's very straightforward. All you need to know is a little bit of JavaScript and maybe have a little bit of hand of designing a new uh, UI. And if you are a partner in ISV and you want to have your own UI in the console directly integrated into OpenShift, you can do that very, very easily. I had a colleague of mine in the PM group actually do a dynamic plugin within two days with nothing uh, but a little bit of JavaScript and a little bit of uh, YAML uh, that you throw the cluster and it makes your console appear. And this is so easy that I think a lot of you can do it as well and can use it to model unique workloads and specific things you want to have specific UI support for in your own clusters. So this is an extremely exciting technology and um, um, definitely recommend you to check it out and try it. Search for dynamic plugins in the OpenShift console. I talked before about the importance of storage and uh, the base layer to actually store persistent data. So this is an area where we are heavily investing in. We are starting from the ground up at the container storage interface level, where we will teach OpenShift how to use CSI for resizing of volume, provisioning of ephemeral volumes, SA Linux mounts, as well as uh, bring in all the cloud provider uh, plugins again through the CSI uh, framework. So this is how we enable the individual clusters to work effectively with the infrastructure through the standard interface. And then a layer higher, we are starting to bring in multi-cluster capabilities. We have uh, a multi-cluster object gateway that is used with the Ceph and Rook project to create an S3 compatible storage in your storage landscape. So it's an object storage by, uh, uh, by nature but we are going to add a file system persona to that. So we are going to be able to pretend that what's actually underneath an object storage bucket is actually a file system. And there are a lot of uh, apps out there that rely on shared file systems and a file system style object storage is a way to make that work across clusters in a read write uh, 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 active active fashion. But also on the other end of the extreme, we have smaller clusters, very small clusters indeed, in the form of single node OpenShift, SNO, where OpenShift and all of its technology is running on a single server. These systems are usually not connected to a larger shared storage network or complicated storage system, and they need to you know, work with what they have in the local server. And we are exposing that with the same management capabilities through the logical volume management operator, which makes use of the LVM stack and the rel kernel to essentially give you a little bit of light storage provisioning on a single node, but through the standard interfaces of ODF. And then one layer higher, we are introducing these multi-cluster shared networking uh, and shared storage capabilities. What we will be able to do with um, uh, ACM and uh, OpenShift storage uh, working together is facilitate and orchestrate a disaster recovery failover from one cluster to another. So your application is managed via ACM and deployed via ACM, but the storage is uh, managed and provided by OpenShift Data Foundation. And these two technologies integrate in a way that they use this vault sync technology that I mentioned before to replicate data continuously in the background. And if a cluster fails, you will be able to initiate a disaster recovery step that will move the entire uh, application definition to the surviving cluster where all the data is already present because it was continuously migrated. So this is something that's orchestrated and available to you basically as a result of an action in ACM rather than you going into the systems and redirecting storage and redeploying applications, reactivating storage all manually. So this gets you out of a disaster really, really quickly. On the other hand, we hear you about requirements in OpenShift's uh, uh, data protection space with the ability to do backup and restore. And we get this so often, and we have so many partners that want to integrate with OpenShift in backup and recovery, in that we have provided additional APIs for them to integrate into the platform. So the OpenShift data protection APIs will become version 1.0 this year. And these are the integration points that backup vendors will use to integrate with, um, with OpenShift. Speaking of storage, I mentioned uh, before that whenever you have more than a couple of clusters running, you definitely want to have some sort of central truth for all the images that you're running in these clusters. This is what a central registry does. And once you serve more than one cluster, this registry needs to be really, really highly available and really, really performant. Because if the registry is down, you will notice in your clusters within five minutes, I guarantee you. This is uh, the idea that the project Quay registry has been designed with from day one. It's the same code base that powers the public Quay IO registry. And it's also available as a open source project with project Quay and a product with Red Hat Quay. And we are looking to integrate this product now 
into the same unified console framework that you've seen earlier and also bring the visual appearance of Quay.io into the fold where all the rest of the Red Hat managed services are available at console.redhat.com. Security scanning remains an important aspect of uh, an image registry because it allows you to scan the images before they actually hit the cluster. Quay already does that uh, since a long time with the Clear Security Scanner and will be enhanced to scan even more content inside a container. We have already introduced support for programming languages like Python, where Quay will be able to report Python package vulnerabilities it finds in the container. We we'll extend that to Java, which is actually in tech preview right now, but also Golang and other scripting languages like Node.js and Ruby. So you will be able to see not just RPM, base OS level vulnerabilities in your image, you will also see language level package manager vulnerabilities. And then finally, our security pillar. Uh, you will have a, a session about it later today, but uh, the Stackrocks project is um, the community version of Red Hat Advanced Cluster Security. This is the last component that Dan has shown in his demo. And this is a central piece of actually having sort of peace of mind and faith in your multi-cluster vision. So you're not opening yourself up to a lot of rogue workloads and tenants that do all kinds of unsecure things in your clusters. You can still centrally control what kind of security policies are in place, what kind of workloads can run, and what is your tolerance towards security vulnerabilities. So ACS and multi-cluster security does it at runtime. So versus the registry, which does it at rest, ACS will tell you what's going on in the cluster in the context of the running workload. So what it will do here is integrate with the uh, six store project I mentioned earlier. So it will be able to uh, define policies around you only accepting containers that are signed for execution and prevent unsigned containers or containers that fail signature verification from being executed. This is how you ensure only trusted workloads run in your cluster. There will also be uh, an ability to define network policies. So a lot of users want to essentially compartmentalize and isolate their applications at the network level, which is an extremely good idea in the security space, but it's also very complicated, right? So ACS will provide a graphical editor for that, and it already has insight into the cluster traffic already based on its EPPF level uh, packet filtering capability. And it will make use of this insight to recommend you known traffic patterns to, trans, uh, to basically express them as network policies and say this known pattern is now allowed and everything outside is not allowed anymore. So this yields network policies, they need to be applied to the cluster and we already have a technology that applies policies to a cluster. This is ACM and open cluster management with its integration with Gatekeeper to apply policies at scale. So ACS will just hand over its network policies to ACM as well and make this component apply them to the cluster. Compliance is an important aspect for corporate security. And if you haven't heard about the compliance operator, you will hear about it today from Kirsten, um, uh, how it helps you basically prove to auditors that you are certain, that you apply to certain compliance levels. The compliance operator will also get a graphical interface, and this interface will sit in ACS. In the next topic, um, uh, Ramon will walk you through um, what we are doing with deployment flexibility, and I'll then come back to walk you through our standardization technology. So you've seen a lot of details of uh, what's going on with OpenShift. Sometimes we get the question of um, what's the difference between OpenShift and Kubernetes. And you know, with what Daniel showed us before, with uh, the other Daniel has just explained, you can see, you know, it's many pieces together that we package, we make them easy to consume. And this is where we are, you know, the, the, the value that OpenShift is providing. Um, I promise I'm going to try to be quick and just go through the fun stuff, but you're going to see many letters um, written in there. And let me start by installing OpenShift, updating OpenShift, and integrating OpenShift with more providers, right? So what are we doing here? Um, in terms of adding new platforms, um, we have a few uh, new platforms. Uh, some of them are already there, some of them in the roadmap, Alibaba Cloud, IBM Cloud. Uh, and Nutanix as well. This actually uh, is not only, you know, what we are doing with adding more platforms, we're also adding more regions to the existing platforms. So this is a continuous, especially with the large uh, main ones, uh, public clouds, it's a continuous effort that we are making. Um, in the middle, installation, you need to install OpenShift, right? Uh, if you are not doing it self-managed and 
Well, installing OpenShift needs to be easy as well, but at the same time, we need to cover all these use cases that I'm sure each of you will have and all have seen, right? We need to make it easy. And we are working on, um, and I'll give a, a brief update later, an agent-based installer. We'll see what's that in, in a second. Um, hosted control planes, have you heard of that? So now imagine you want um, many clusters, right? Different types of clusters. Uh, but you would like to have one shared control plane somewhere. Imagine three nodes, for example, or, or six nodes. It doesn't matter. Serving to thousands of uh, uh, workers, right? Uh, nodes, Kubernetes nodes, in different clusters, just sharing the control plane. That's an awesome idea and, and very practical indeed. So we're working on that. Uh, we're calling it so far uh, HyperShift. What else we are doing? And then. Upgrades. Upgrades is always a challenge, isn't it? Uh, many times customers say, well, you know, I will only upgrade between extended user support versions, like, I don't know, between 4.6 and uh, 4.10, things like this, just to save the hassle of uh, managing upgrades. Well, we're working on making this continuously as well, but it's always in our roadmap and in our pipeline, make these uh, improvements with upgrades. Um, bare metal. So, by the way, I'm uh, the product manager of, uh, for everything bare metal. So this is a topic uh, very close to me. <laughs> and uh, I, I could talk a lot about this, but I'm not uh, going to. Only that, let me tell you this. Do you know the project uh, Metal Cubed? It says Metal 3, but uh, in the community we call it Metal Cubed. So essentially with Metal Cubed, you can manage physical servers as if they were virtual machines or just an instance in a public cloud, right? That's, that's incredible. You know, we've been doing this for years. Uh, it's a pretty mature project. In fact, it's leveraging technologies that existed previously. Uh, Ironic, maybe you have heard of OpenStack Ironic. So that's what manages, uh, or in fact, that's the engine uh, underneath um, Metal Cubed. Anyway, so Metal Cubed, managing loads of servers, managing many more with all the improvements that we are making uh, in it. Move metal and installation. How else can you deploy OpenShift? Well, we have a cloud installer. We have what we call the assisted installer. So essentially, you go to console.openshift.com, log in with your Red Cat credentials, and then you can have access directly to an installer on the web. Right? You don't need to download a client, anything. Just say, this is how I want my cluster to look like. And then you're going to get an ISO. And then you just boot the ISO in the nodes of the cluster that you want to build, right? Super cool. And in fact, uh, we are, <clears throat> uh, yeah, we are working on a on-premise version of the assisted installer that will also give you even more um, flexibility, right? Disconnected environments, uh, well, things that uh, you need when you are on-prem that perhaps um, you can do with um, when you work from the SaaS. Um, so that's what we call the Asian-based uh, installer for now, internally. That's how we are calling it. Um, what else are we working on? OpenShift virtualization. Have you heard of uh, Qbert? Yeah? So Qbert, pretty impressive project as well. We've been working for years uh, at Red Hat. Uh, so in fact, uh, you know, now it's pretty mature. Uh, it's, it's been years of you know, ramping up, adding features, uh, making it so that you can do everything you would do with your traditional virtualization platforms, only that from OpenShift. That's, that's pretty cool. That's, that's actually incredible, having achieved all of this. And in fact, the recognition to this uh, maturity level is that it's now an incubating project. Uh, so that's what level up in maturity in the CNCF, right? Qbert, pretty cool project. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about, before we were talking about the footprints, right, where you can install OpenShift. One of the footprints is the edge, right? And in the edge, uh, edge computing, um, it applies to telcos, but not only to telcos. So anybody who needs to install OpenShift on a remote location um, will benefit from all the improvements that we are adding for this kind of um, uh, topology. Right? For example, these, these places may not have even space for three servers, right? So we may need to install OpenShift in just one server when you are on the edge. 
they may have connectivity, but perhaps not all the time. So we need a way to be able to do uh, management of these clusters under these circumstances, right? Many times from a central uh, point of management, which is um, ACS, the advanced cluster manager that uh, Daniel uh, O has uh, shown us before, right? Did you see how sophisticated we can get to manage, you know, the, the mind sweeper, right? Uh, those who are, are old enough uh, probably have played the mind sweeper in the past uh, with Microsoft. So now you could, you know, explore all of that while learning about ACS for security, advanced cluster management. Uh, you know, to manage many, many clusters distributed. Well, this applies to the edge. Um, and then in the edge, we have also very specific needs. For example, um, in terms of uh, real time workloads, right? So we need to fine tune our servers so that they can provide the performance that these applications need, applications that process traffic in real time, um, things like this that require complete dedication of the machines you are running your workloads on. Um, and related to this single node OpenShift, as we were saying, you can install OpenShift in just one node. We've been working a lot on SNO, as we call it internally, um, to make it you know, um, as, as good as any other cluster, but also within the constraints of one node. That's not an easy task, right? Uh, so imagine you have the master node, the worker node, all together. Uh, all competing for resources, right? The, the workloads are competing for resources with the, the management of the cluster, right? The ingress operator, the, you know, everything that you will have in there. Um, so we made it happen, not, not an easy project, but we made it happen. It's fully supported since last year. And now, look at this, we can virtualize uh, workloads in one cluster, right? sorry, in a single node cluster. That's pretty impressive if, if you ask me, adding this support. Also, not only for bare metal, because initially, I mean, this takes a lot of resources. Uh, OpenShift in general, put on top all the workloads, right? All in one node, so we really need to be very careful how we split the resources in, in this node. So that was mainly bare metal, even though internally, you know, we try it in every platform. Now we are adding support to vSphere as well. So you can have a single node cluster on vSphere. Pretty cool as well. Another thing that uh, the team behind us, you know, is working on is, well, you may need sometimes more capacity. Maybe you start with one SNO and at some point you need to scale because you have more workloads, right? So you're going to be able to add more workers or simply add workers because you start with just one node, right? To add more workers to, your, to, in, to increase your uh, capacity. I know there's some, just to mention it, OVN, Kubernetes. Do, do you know OVN? You know that you can use SDN OpenShift for the network or OVN. Well, OVN is kind of like um, the thing that's taking more uh, adoption uh, for managing the, the, the network, the CNI in Kubernetes, and SNO is not going to be an exception. Um, and lastly, if this thing, yeah, here we go. Um, ARM, right? Uh, this architecture that, you know, how many of you have an M1 laptop right now with uh, the Apple one? Yeah, it's, it's pretty impressive, huh? Uh, like, you know, my fans don't go off, like almost never, or, or I think never so far, now that summer is coming. So, and in not, not only, this is just an example, you know, in, in laptops, but ARM is really uh, present in many, many data centers, including the Amazon data centers with AWS, right? So OpenShift, again, is no exception. We are supporting ARM. Um, we've been supporting them already, and what's coming? We're doing something pretty cool as well. Uh, so now you're going to have a cluster that will allow you to spread, to distribute your workloads in the same cluster between ARM or x86, right? You actually will tell the workload when you define it, uh, which architecture is it, and then it will be placed in the right uh, servers as these little uh, graphic tries to show you. Um, and with this, I'll pass it over back to Dan to finish with uh, standardization. Thanks, Ramon. So let's finish with standardization. I'm going to be respectful of time and also the break that we have scheduled. So uh, 
I'll move a little bit quicker on this one. But the first thing we are going to standardize is the way you are installing OpenShift behind the firewall without connectivity to redhat.com or registry.redhat.io. I know that many of you are doing this and that the process in the past has been sort of fragmented and a little bit hard to automate and everybody needed to write their own automation to do this continuously. So in order to install OpenShift uh, without internet connections, you need to mirror all the images in uh, your registry, right? And you need to have a registry first as well. So, um, and depending on what type of images we are mirroring, the tooling was different and also the steps were different. And then we didn't really give you any recommendation or guidance of how to do this over time to keep updates coming in, right? So we are going to standardize this project now, uh, this process now, and uh, we have a new utility that's going to wrap all the existing utilities in one single command, uh, one single utility that's working off a single declarative configuration file. We call it OC Mirror. It's part of the OC client, but it's actually a plugin for the OC client. In the very same way, kubectl has plugins, OC has plugins, because it's the kubectl client, basically. And OC Mirror is a, is, a, uh, is a binary tool that allows you to create a mirror for many managed clusters that are running different versions and keep this mirror up to date over time. It will be able to take your declarative intent from the config file where you state for which exact OpenShift version you want to run in your data center, which operators uh, you want to run there, uh, custom images, Helm charts, all this stuff that you need behind the firewall. Um, and it will download all this data from the various places. And it will either generate what's called an image set, which is something you can throw in a tarball and move over behind an air gap with a USB stick. Or if you have direct connectivity from the OC mirror host to a registry, stream it into your own registry as well. And from there, you can run all the clusters. And this tool has a lot of intelligence built in. It will understand when new OpenShift releases have been published. It will understand how the update graphs for the operators will work and if new versions are available. And it will, if you ask it to, automatically mirror those as well. You only need to execute the tool again. So really the way to automate this and keep most up to date as if you were connected is to just run OC mirror in something as simple as a cron job on a system every night. And then it will continuously mirror all your content into a uh, registry or into an image set so you can keep your disconnected clusters as up to date as if you were connected. It's a very seamless experience now and we're going to move it to GA later this year. At the compute level of where you execute your workloads, we are also driving standardization. So we are going to standardize on cert manager as the de facto way to provision TLS certs, rotate them, and, uh, and, 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 and provision them in the cluster and attach them to workloads. Um, this will be GA later this year. It's already in tech preview. We are also going to pick up policy uh, security admission controllers. This is a feature that's in Kube 124, um, but they are not enabled by default. We are going to make them enabled by default in OpenShift and we'll work uh, uh, on making that compatible with our security context constraints so that automatically the uh, restricted policy is enforced. Um, we are also uh, going to have, um, as you heard previously, mixed architecture support. So you can run not just ARM and x86, but also x86 and Power or System C in one cluster versus as it is now in separate clusters, which makes workload placement really effective. Um, we are also uh, uh, going to improve logging, so you will be able to see log-in attempts and log-in processes in the audit logs, and we are also going to fine-tune the uh, auditing and uh, logging level of the API server itself to reduce a little bit of noise that usually comes in with the API server being very busy, but also cover scenarios that we aren't covering today. For instance, when you have webhooks in your cluster and some of these webhooks are broken, this could actually destabilize your entire cluster. So the API server will recognize the situation and warn you about it and tell you exactly where the breakage is. And one thing that I'm super excited about uh, is uh, OpenShift Chorus layering. And this, is, and this is huge because we previously took the stance that the worker node image is immutable and it's always the same. It comes from us and you are not supposed to touch it. Anything you need in addition to that has to be executed in a container as a workload on top of OpenShift. So any kind of agent, additional software that you need running there for regulations and compliance requirements um, needs to come from you uh, as, a, as a part on top of OpenShift. And you all told us that this is not working. This is too complicated and it's, uh, you need the ability to customize the worker node. And with core as layering, we're giving you that ability. Uh, Karina will later today talk a little bit more in detail about this, but 
the short story here is, is that CoreOS is now a container-based image, like UBI. And then in the same way you build your applications on top of UBI, you will be able to customize the worker node image by building a new container image of the core as base image. In the process, you install your own RPMs, you install your own agents, uh, additional RPMs from Red Hat channels, whatever you like, and this creates a new image, which is then saved in the cluster. And the worker nodes know exactly what changed in those images and will roll out these changes on the worker nodes. And this is not just persisting reboots, it will actually persist across cluster updates. So we are giving you a golden image build process for your own customized worker images that are supported to run OpenShift and will update with the cluster, will always keep up to date with the cluster. Really cool, huge change in direction, giving you the ability to finally cluster, uh, customize your worker nodes uh, with CoreOS instead of having to use RHEL. And we are also standardizing how we manage applications. This is already coming as a template from ACM, but as you know, we are heavily invested uh, in GitOps with the Argo CD project. We are working to enable additional tenancy models, going from a very central model that you see on the left-hand side here, uh, where there is a single Argo CD instance that's pushing into all managed clusters, or an Argo CD instance per cluster that's putting workload and application definitions from a central Git repository and pushes them to different namespaces, or even more extreme on the right hand side, you have an Argo CD instance per tenant as in per namespace on the cluster, which is just responsible for one application being deployed and continuously updated. Um, GitOps and Argo CD will also be enhanced to support a uh, 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 si uh, single sign-on with Keycloak and Red Hat. We'll get refinements and Helm processing and also integrate with HashiCorp Vault later this year. And, uh, before uh, uh, we wrap up, I want to give you a little bit of an outlook on a super interesting uh, project that we are working on that takes a completely different approach to multi-cluster ring. So um, if you think about it, the way Kubernetes is built, the way the control plane is working with its eventual goal-seeking uh, uh, approach and its eventual consistency and its extensibility, this is actually very useful even outside of containers. And we already see this because we have operators in the cluster that don't do anything on the cluster. What they do is they communicate with an external service like Microsoft Azure or AWS and provision resources there and just report back status. But they don't do anything with the cluster. So these are controllers that are sort of Kubernetes controllers, but they're not doing anything with Kubernetes except maybe dropping a config map where pointing you to the stuff that they've deployed, right? And you see that this concept of the Kubernetes control plane is very generic. And we think it is so generic that it can actually automate the entire data center, the entire cloud. And we make use of that and say, we are going to basically extract the guts of the control plane, just the API server with very known concepts like namespace and RBAC, but not a lot more than that. Make it really, really small, so small it can run on your laptop, you know, single binary. And we call that KCP, the Kubernetes control plane or the smart control plane. And that control plane doesn't, isn't attached to a single cluster running on your laptop. It's actually attached to multiple clusters that you bring into the fold by selecting your own clusters or getting clusters from Aro, Rosa, or OSD. And the beauty of this is, is that this is something you can give directly to your tenants. Each tenant gets their own little control plane. And this control plane is aware of multi-clustering. It can be extended like we install operators today with controllers that know how to spread a deployment across three or five clusters evenly. There are controllers that are able to understand that config maps and secrets have to be replicated in all these physical clusters down there. And from the user perspective, this looks and feels like a single cluster, only that these components that you see as parts, deployments and services are actually replicated and distributed in the background completely independently of any changes in your application uh, to make multi-cluster a reality. So all your Helm charts, all your customized templates, all your GitOps processes will likely completely work unchanged, but instead of throwing them into a cluster, you throw them at KCP. And KCP will manage multiple physical clusters in the background transparently. And we are planning to roll out this service later this year where every tenant gets its own KCP, 
Remember, it's extremely small. You know, there's not a lot of overhead in executing it. So we are giving one per tenant, and they can uh, connect uh, to their existing clusters or request clusters from Rosa or OSD and Aro to actually provide compute capacity in the background. And these clusters could sit anywhere in the world, could be geographically distributed, and KCP is the common front end for that. So. This is an exciting project. It's not part of OpenShift yet or CNCF. Uh, it's very uh, early still. Um, follow the GitHub to learn more about this but, uh, and, and look at the demo. It's really nice. Um, and uh, uh, keep tabs with that because this is an interesting space uh, to watch. With that, um, we are uh, at the end of our outlook and uh, uh, insight into how we as product managers are thinking about OpenShift's future, what we plan with multi-clustering, deployment flexibility and standardization, and even you know, very exotic things like KCP. Um, we hope we gave you an insight into what's coming, and we invite you to join us in the afternoon for the Ask Me Anything session, where we'll be able to answer your questions um, and uh, uh, give you a little bit of uh, uh, another insight as well into topics we haven't covered today. Uh, it's a large platform. Uh, you'll see there is so much going on. There is no possibility to cover this in a single hour. But any questions you have, also on stuff we haven't touched on, come see us again at the AMA. We'll be there for you to answer your questions.